in this one. This is a laser. Thanks for uh, having me uh, give this talk, first of all. Um, I'll just present uh, basically my PG project over the last uh, three years. So it will just be a bunch of everything. Um, so as we have seen um, in, in this uh, conference so far, many people study the microbiome. Microbiome communities are important. Um, and what I think is really cool is that lots of people study like kind of communities as a whole, which is super interesting to look at and people sequence it and we look at all of these species and what do they do and how do they interact. I would have loved to do that, but in my project, I just took basically the same strain and made it interact with itself. But it's interesting because you can, um, I mean, it's, it's kind of a reduced system, right? It's a synthetic community. So in that sense, maybe you'll, it will be easier to understand things from, from it. Um, so, but fear not, I did base the system on sort of an existing system, uh, which, uh, evolves if you grow, um, E. coli for long enough in glucose, what happens is you basically get a community. So you start off with, uh, with the wild type strain, which has a, a certain growth rate and a certain glucose uptake rate. And then if you evolve it for long enough, you actually get two strains, sometimes three, but most of the time two, <laughs> one that has um, uh, a higher growth rate with a lower glucose uptake rate and one that has a, a slightly lower uh, growth rate with a higher glucose uptake rate. So it seems um, kind of like a, a rate yield strategy that you're, you're getting. And what, you, what also these researchers showed is that actually the, the one that takes up glucose faster um, excretes acetate that can be taken up by, by the other strain. So you get kind of naturally get some sort of, of cross feeding. So um, this is basically the, the, the system that, I, that we decided to study. Um, first of all, with the model, which I didn't make, but uh, Marco made it, who also presented earlier, who did a postdoc before me, who came up with this, uh, who came up with this system where, well, you have indeed this, uh, this species that we now call uh, the producer, uh, which we could maybe use to produce some proteins for us, some whatever we, we, we think is useful in the moment. And, um, but if, um, but it's, uh, since E. coli excretes also acetate uh, when it grows on glucose, as we, as we saw in the previous slide, um, this can be a problem because acetate can be slightly toxic for the cells. So this kind of leaves room for a thing that we could call a cleaner that cleans up the acetate. Um, and in this way, we, we, could we could get a stable consortium. And uh, the system was then studied uh, in a chemostat, where then you study basically every time the steady state. So um, what, what, we did, what we did in the model was to, to vary the dilution rate. So dilution rate is basically the inflow as with respect to the, the reactor volume. So then kind of results you, you, you get are, are first, uh, this is just uh, the dynamics of, of the producer over time. And so you see that the producer biomass increases and, and then the cleaner biomass kind of decreases, but also reaches a steady state, and there's some acetate also at the end. And so then if you look at all of these um, steady states, but at different dilution rates, um, then the kind of plot that you, you can get is this, where you, you have on the y-axis the biomass um, of the producer and the cleaner, and on the x-axis the different dilution rates, and this are then, then the steady state values. And you see that there's basically a certain range of dilution rates where you find both, where you expect to find both the producer and the cleaner. And this in, this mo in our model is because uh, this is the dilution rate at which the producer starts to excrete acetate. And so that leaves the room for the cleaner. Below this dilution rate, there's no acetate, so there's no clear opportunity for the cleaner to grow. And above it, the growth rate of the species is simply too low to keep up with the dilution rate, so they're both flushed out at the end. And then what, uh, what was also promising about this is that um, if you actually look at the productivity of the consortium at this, um, at the, in this region, so the productivity being the amount of protein that you produce per time unit, then um, you can see that actually, if you look at the, the green line, which is the productivity of the single strain versus the red line, which is the, which it would be the productivity of the consortium, you see that there's e even a region where the consortium could be slightly more productive than the single strain. So basically this 
opened uh, a window for my PhD, which was, ah, this is actually an interesting consortium. Let's make it in the lab. So thanks, Marco, for this great model. <laughs> so then my model is take this consortium to the lab. So I, uh, I constructed it. Um, I added some, some changes to, to one of the strains to make it into an actual cleaner. Then I, uh, I studied the conditions for coexistence. So do we actually find the same region, the same region of dilution rates in the lab as in the model? And then eventually, when if we have a model and we see that it corresponds well with the reality and we can predict um, the conditions for coexistence, then maybe we can even control um, our consortium and control the species abundances and in this way optimize also protein production. That would be, of course, the ideal situation. So the, the cleaner in the lab then um, is like this. I added fluorescent markers to each of the strains so that we can actually measure the abundances of each of them which of course in the model is easy to track, but in reality, not so much. And then in the cleaner, I overexpress the acid uptake rate. So I put um, one of the uptake systems on the plasmid and I knocked out the glucose uptake rate. Um, I knocked out the glucose uptake um, by knocking out the main glucose uptake system, which still allows it to take up some glucose because there's also side systems, but way less than, um, than the producer. So then here is uh, what kind of so, so yeah, then what, what, we, what we first wanted to do was to um, kind of verify that the initial model fits with the individual species. And since we had slightly different strains and the initial model was calibrated on that, this is, we, we had to change a bit the parameters and make some fits. So this is, for example, a fit of just a producer on glucose in a, in a batch. So you, you see that you add, well, you start with a bunch of glucose, which I didn't actually plot, but uh, believe me that this biomass is formed because it's, 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 it's eating glucose and during growth on glucose some acetate is being produced and once the growth on glucose is over this acetate is being consumed and uh, and then uh, the batch phase ends and then the, we managed to to fit the model quite well um, this is what the, the model actually looks like so it's a it's a system of ordinary differ, differential equations um, and this is then um, how the biomass changes biomass changes over time so basically it's kind of, it's just this whole term is basically the growth rate times the biomass minus some degradation, which is which we heard also before, it's kind of this maintenance term. Like if there's no, nothing coming in, then the, the, then, uh, the amount of biomass is gonna degrade slightly. And then minus also the dilution in case you're in a chemo set, in this case you're in batch, so the dilution is actually zero. Um, so yeah, these terms are basically just, this is um, uh, what's left after you produce the heterologous protein. Here is, um, the, the glucose term, so the yield times the rate, and this is the, the acetate term, so the yield of acetate times um, like the, the uptake of acetate minus the overflow. Um, so basically what we, uh, this is then what the rate, uh, um, what the glucose uptake rate looks like. So that's kind of gonna determine how steep this, this curve is gonna be. So we had to, to adapt slightly the, the maximal glucose uptake rate. And also we added, there's a, in the model, there's a term for, um, uh, acetate toxicity. So uh, yeah, if there's more acetate, then your glucose uptake rate is going to be uh, slightly lower. And this is how the, the, the acetate uh, dynamics then come about. There's an overflow and there's an uptake. And how, how, it's modeled, how, it's modeled, how it was modeled initially is, is that there is some threshold for acetate excretion. So if you have a certain glucose uptake rate, then there, if you have a low glucose uptake rate, there's no acetate excretion. And uh, until you reach this threshold, and then you start excreting acetate proportionally to, to the glucose uptake rate. So in, in batch, this kind of just corresponds to uh, you're always excreting because you're always below this glucose uptake rate. But in a chemo set, this is not going to be the case. Um, and then uh, the, the uh, uh, acetate uptake rate is actually um, subject to carbon catabolite repression. So if you're taking up a lot of glucose, then you cannot take up acetate, which then leads to indeed this, this dioxic behavior here. You're taking up glucose, so this acetate is being excreted until you're, you reach a certain low glucose uptake rate. So yeah, this is all quite like just sort of phenomenological, right? We know these things happen, so we know they should be in the model. Uh, so what do, what, uh, what does the cleaner growth on glucose look like? So here you see the basically the biomass of the producer building up versus the cleaner in glucose in batch. And so the only difference between the producer and the cleaner is that the cleaner has a slightly lower maximal glucose uptake rate. And in terms of acetate, it's not exactly the same. There we see that the cleaner grows faster on acetate than the producer. 
Um, and what we did there is instead of uh, changing this maximum glucose uptake rate, we added, we, we added an additional term for acetate uptake, which is not sub subject to carbon metabolite depression. Um, so yeah, once we kind of have this confirmation that the model fits well with the individual species, um, we were like, okay, now we, can, we should grow them together, but how are we going to actually measure the abundances? Well, I added these fluorescent proteins, not for nothing. Um, how are we actually going to make use of them? Well, one of them is just, one, one way is to just use, measure the total fluorescence and sort of derive uh, biomass from there. Another way that we kind of use, we kind of use both of them just to cross-validate that results are valid is, um, is by using flow cytometry. So in, in flow cytometry, what you do basically is you, you take your sample, you dilute it, and you push it through a, a, a capillary. And in this capillary, there's a laser being sh uh, shined on it, shown on it. Um, anyway, uh, and what's important here is that you actually uh, push the cells through one by one. Um, so you have to dilute your sample enough and make sure that they're separated so that you can actually measure properties of individual cells and not of clumps of cells. So then what it kind of might look like is, I saw this on Twitter the other day, I thought it was very nice. So yeah, this is kind of what it then looks like. You, you have the individual cells, and since they are going through one by one, we can study them. Um, so then the kind of result that you might get in the end um, is, uh, is, are these kind of plots where you measure, where for each cell you can plot the, you can in, um, inspect the properties. So for example, for you plot the forward, uh, the orange intensity or the red intensity versus the forward scatter. And if a cell has more uh, fluorescent intensity than another, then we might say, ah, this is a cleaner cell and this is a producer cell. And in the end, this is always a bit exaggerated, but anyway, in the end you get two clouds that you can then calculate the fraction of each of the clouds. And of course, in real life, they're not as e well separated as here. So you have to, to do a little bit of math, but then uh, you get there. And then this is what for us it looked like uh, if we just make sort of known mixtures of, of, of um, fractions. So if we have only red cells and we see that indeed we have a, like a nice red cloud, if we have only blue cells, then well, the blue cells are, don't actually look blue because we don't have the right lasers, but well, we have this cloud here. Um, and then if you have mixtures, then you also get something. And what's, what's kind of important also is that, unfortunately, if you have only M9, then you also have some dots. So you have to correct for that as well, because unfortunately these dots are in the same cloud. But okay, we can, we can do that, it's uh, doable. And then uh, in, in what we did in our, in our experiments is actually we, 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 we grow the culture, um, the culture continuously and we take samples every, well, here it's two hours. So for each time point, we get, um, we get these clouds and then we can calculate at each time the fraction. And then if you convert this to, to, to a plot, then this is basically um, the, the, the cleaner fraction. So we started off with a lot of cleaner here and then, um, and this is the total biomass. So what you see is that basically only the producer is growing in the, in the, at this dilution rate um, and the cleaner is, is, being, is being flushed out. So what does this uh, bioreactor that we actually, so maybe I didn't even say this, but anyway, we're going this uh, strange in like this bioreactor, this chemostat, and uh, it's like kind of a self-made thing that we have in the lab. So it's reactors of 15 milliliter where we pump in medium, we pump out waste. So you have a chemostat, you have also air uh, that mixes and also provides oxygen. And you can take samples where you then measure the total fluorescence, the absorbance, and you can pump it to flow cytometry. So that's basically what I did in the previous uh, slide. So this is what it looks like in the lab. So here are the reactors. So this is then an incubator. So they keep it at 37 degrees. And here is done basically just all the medium are kind of on the ground floor and they're being pumped using peristaltic pumps to, to, to our cultures. And then we also have the flow cytometer in the same room. So we can, we can actually take out samples, dilute them, pump them to the flow cytometer. Um, so yeah, what are actually the co conditions for coexistence? <laughs> well, as we said, uh, the, um, Expectation was, okay, maybe we would find the cleaner at, at uh, high dilution rates and not at low ones because there's acetate and, and, uh, at high dilution rates and not at low ones. Well, this is where kind of the more uh, in progress part starts. So <laughs> uh, this is my result so far. So this is just, um, uh, here's the absorbance and uh, the red fluorescence over time where I kind of just, um, where I, where I uh, normalize the time for the dilution rate. So if Basically, it makes sense that if you go at a low dilution rate, you need a longer time to actually reach any sort of steady state. So it's time times dilution rate, which then corresponds to like residence times. So how, how many times the, the reactor volume uh, sort of uh, exchanged. So what you see is here that, okay, the, the absorbance reaches for, for each of the, th the, the three, the, so it's 
three different dilution rates, which is a different steady state, but they, it seems quite stable. And for um, the red fluorescence, we actually reach uh, zero in the end for the 0 0.4, dilution rate of 0 0.4, but for 0 0.2 and 0 0.1, we actually are not quite at zero yet. So it actually seems kind of the opposite result. We get uh, we get cleaner at uh, low dilution rates, but not at high ones. Now, of course, this is a very uh, minor uh, difference. So yeah, this is still to be confirmed and investigated further and more tests to be done. But in any case, it seems that um, in our community, the most interesting regions to study are low dilution rates and not high ones. And that's a bit of a shame because actually our model is not that interesting at low dilution rates because we have this threshold built in at it, right? We, there's no acetate at low dilution rates. So, okay, well, we're gonna change the model. <laughs> ah, yeah, this is just to show that many people found that uh, there's apparently this threshold for acetate. So there, yeah, just different people finding a similar result. Um, but, but the thing is that uh, the fact that you don't find any acetate doesn't mean that there's no acetate flux, right? It could be that maybe there's the same amount going in as going out. So uh, indeed, we, we then, well, had this idea, well, we didn't have this idea, people already had this idea that acetate is kind of continuously cycling in and out of the cell that was kind of is being, being shown more and more. So, so when we make a model of acetate cycling, which I'm not showing here, it's, but if you want to talk about it, you can, uh, we can actually show that, yeah, you can get a model where the, you basically have a net, you have, no, you have the same overflow as uptake, which then leads to indeed this kind of threshold. The time is almost up. Okay, perfect. Then, um, so yeah, you can get a, a sort of threshold like model, even if you don't actually implement it as a phenomenological rule. And then indeed in this model that I, that I set up, you can also get coexistent at low dilution rates and not high ones. The, these are, these are just qualitative things that we indeed we can now do with the model, but, uh, and so yeah, then once, uh, now we have maybe a better model that we have, we have to, we have to validate also more and, then we can hopefully also use it to, in, in the end, uh, control the consortium. I have some plots with control, but it's not that. Uh... So yeah, I hope we showed you a bit how to how to construct a community in the lab and study study conditions for uh, co study conditions for coexistence and maybe control species abundances, and maybe a take home message is that a good model for single species might uh, might be improved for for two species. If you have time. So we have time for a few questions. Is here? Well, I'm wondering, do you have any mutations, do you think? Uh, like, I guess this is multiple days as well? Yeah, but it's not that many. Um, this, so this was uh, three, four days of growth. Yeah, I, I think it's not that uh, significant mutations in our, in our system. You can isolate, my, uh, I guess, isolate yeah, yeah, yeah. They... yeah, like what we do plate them like afterwards and see if they still have the same properties. We haven't really sequenced them, but yeah, they do still like kind of, you know, these properties that are important for our system that they have low glu glucose uptake rates and higher acetate rates. And those are still true after, after the experiment as well. Other questions? Yeah. So you um, postulate that acetate can be recycled. Hmm. Why do you think cells want to yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I personally think that it's maybe kind of an artifact of just growing them at really high glucose uptake rates that we do in the lab. But normally, that normally you find them kind of in conditions where uptake is more important than overflow, and just the way they take up acetate is kind of like this more thermodynamic way. It's not, so they can take it up and and, and excrete it. And then if you grow them at high glucose concentration, this leads to excretion. But usually if you grow in the gut, for some, for example, there's much more acetate, so it will always lead to uptake instead of excretion. So I don't know if there's like a real reason or if it's just kind of an artifact of growing them in the lab. But yeah, I don't have like, yeah, it would be interesting to investigate that more. Yeah. There's Samia in the room. Yeah, yeah so maybe you start sitting there. Or when you can ask a question meanwhile. Yeah. Yeah. So we can also fit fit the batch results to with the acetate, with the acetate cycling. Okay. Yes, because basically what happens is that um, if you um, well, there's two effects. One is you growing um, you're growing fast on glucose, so this kind of leads to to this kind of leads to to excretion, like it leads to excretion this way, and then once 
one, so there's kind of a thermodynamic effect that sort of the internal concentrations are higher during growth on glucose, so it leads to excretion. And then once glucose is over, the external concentrations of acetate are higher, so it leads to uptake, if that makes sense. So, and then there's also another thing, is, which is that you still have this other gene, ACS, which is actually under carbon catabolite repression, which also still, yeah, but we can, yeah. <laughs> Are there any more questions? No? Then let's thank the speaker again. So our next speaker is Amir. And then Amir is from that's a, uh, MIT. Let's see if we can get it to work.